Hello, and welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Richard Lowe. I am recording this from a closet in a barracks at Fort Knox. I am currently doing my healthcare recruiting course. We were supposed to have a PT test this morning, so we all woke up and uh, shuffled over at 5 a.m. to the gym to do our PT test, our our sit-ups, push-ups, and run. Turns out there's too many people at Fort Knox right now uh, being trained, so they couldn't accommodate us this morning. So we're going to do it tomorrow. That's Sometimes you got to wake up at 5 a.m. a couple days in a row in the Army, and that's okay. So uh, this week's episode, we are back to the case acceptance theme. As always with our seasons, I have the hardest time wrapping up and moving on because we we cover a topic from multiple different angles. We've covered case acceptance from a number of different angles, but in some ways, like there's a lot more. And, and so we're going to still do probably uh, three or four more case acceptance episodes interspersed with some further update episodes with me, hopefully after today, today is May 1st. It, it's a big day for me. And by the end of the day, I should have some good news to share. And then with some stuff going on in share practices as well. So we've got some update episodes. We're going to have some case acceptance episodes. And then this next season is going to start here probably in about a month or two. So with that being said, this interview was fantastic. I am so excited. I'll I'll, uh, talk about our guest in, in the show, in the interview here. I was just very grateful and proud to have this interview on our show so without too much further, I'll, I'll dive right in. Here is an interview with Vanessa Van Edwards. Before we get into the episode, we want to take a moment to thank Blue Sky Bio for sponsoring this season of Shared Practices. Our listeners know I can geek out about Blue Sky Bio. This is something that I love and I'm very passionate about. But Blue Sky Bio has realized that for everyone geek that exists that loves playing with all these pieces of software and merging files and designing these things, there's probably four or five dentists that really don't want to mess with all of that. They don't want to be the lab where they're designing their own guides, 3D printing, processing, cleaning up, clipping, trimming, inserting guide tubes. They really don't want to add that workflow by a 3D printer and truly taking the time to integrate this into their practice. Because of this, Blue Sky Bio has introduced something called Lab Pronto. This is truly the Uber of digital dentistry in terms of treatment planning implants, surgical guides, ortho aligners. The way it works is once you're in the software with all the pieces that you need, there's a button that says Lab Pronto. You click on that, and now there's actually a list of labs with available time that you can choose to send your files to. They can help you treatment plan, they can help you print or design the surgical guide, whatever level you wanna be involved with. If you wanna do the design yourself and they print it, you can do it that way. If you want more help, if you want more of their involvement and less of your time, they can do that too. You are able to shop with a number of labs that are within Blue Sky Bio's network that understand what they're doing with this software and could really help you out by maximizing your time so that you can do more surgery, more ortho aligners, more patient care, and act less as a digital lab technician. To access these features, update to the latest version of Blue Sky Plan and just click the Lab Pronto button at the top of the software. Okay, I have with us today um, a very special guest to me because, as you all know, we just did a case acceptance season, and I literally had this person in mind the whole time I was designing and scheduling out this season of how amazing it would be to get her work on our show talking about the science of communication and and persuasion and working with people, working with patients— um, and, and on our show, we've also had a lot of dental folks. We haven't had a lot of people who are more broad and kind of na- nationwide or, or well-known by other people. So this is an amazing treat. We have with us today, Vanessa Van Edwards. Vanessa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I like, so I'm, I'm going to geek out for a minute here. Um, when I learned about your work on micro-expressions, and, and to back up for people, Vanessa has... 
an entire company called The Science of People, helping people understand how to communicate, how to build trust, um, how to get across. Like, I can't describe it in any other way that when, when I listen to you on a podcast, I can just like tell, like you're a person I want to be around. You're, you're a warm, oh. happy, friendly person, but you make the other person feel good at the same time. And I'm like, oh, that's such an amazing skill. Oh my, oh my gosh. That's the, like the kindest thing you could have possibly said. Um, I'm so grateful for that. You know, it's funny because you said that you were looking forward to having me on the show and I was actually very looking forward to coming on the show, um, because I love, love, love working with dentists. I know that sounds, um, very funny, very specific, but, um, I've spoken for a number of, um, dental schools, American Student Dental Association, and I love, we have so many of our students in people's school who are dentists. Um, so I'm like, I'm, I was excited to talk to you. Cool. No, that's super cool. And I, I didn't expect that. So that's exciting for me. Um, so just to let everyone else know, if you haven't heard of Vanessa, I would start with her TED Talk, which was amazing, oh. um, and then <laughs> download the audiobook. So uh, Captivate the Science of Succeeding with People. Um, and you read that one yourself, didn't you? I Oh, my gosh. So my my publisher had said, you know, we really want to do an audio, audio book along with Captivate. You know, would you be open to reading it? And I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I... I'm not vocally trained by any means, but I thought, how great would it be to imitate all the friends I quote in my book? And I have stories about my dad, so I, I kind of do his voice. Um, and it was one of the most fun five days recording the audiobook. And and also, it's great because I don't have a podcast. Right. Um, so it was kind of a, a little, I got to dip my toe into your world, your specialty, um, and read the audiobook. And I, I kind of feel like I get invitation to worlds into their cars, into their home. You know, I find that we listen to audiobooks in the most some of the most personal settings. And so I love to be in people's kitchens and their cars and their closets while they're getting dressed and stuff like that. So I love it. No, it's awesome. And and sometimes when authors read their own books, it's it's like, oh, are they gonna do a great job? You absolutely crushed it. Love the book. Um, I think people can get a ton out of it. So we'll have a link for that in the show notes as well. Um, Thank you. So another further geeking out before we get to the topic, which we don't have a ton of time, so I'm I'm I'll I'll do the quick version. When I learned about your work on microexpressions and how a smirk, which um, there's a whole set in, in your in your work of microexpressions that are, how would you describe it? How would you summarize that for people? Yeah. So actually, when I first started diving into the science of people, so I've always been fascinated with what makes people tick, how they work. Um, I always kind of wish there was a formula for people, you know, in algebra. Yeah. And pre-calc, you get these formulas and they kind of give you the quick answer to be able to solve something. And I always was like, where is the formula for people? Is there formulas for conversation or charisma? And so once I started to dive into the research, um, the microexpression was where I realized, why doesn't everyone know this? Every person should be taught this information. Mm. So a microexpression is a very brief, involuntary facial expression that people make when they feel an intense emotion. So, for example, whenever I work with dentists or our dentist, dental students, um, they're really trying to identify um, discomfort and fear just from the verbal communications, right? You're, you have a lot of fear. You can't help that always with the right. pain. But you can begin to pre-identify it um, before someone actually gets any work done and show them that you're their interesting hands, you are the most competent person to take care of them, that your hygienists are also the most competent and warm people to take care of them. Yeah. And so a microexpression, for example, one of them is fear. So there are seven different universal microexpressions. And fear is a very, very um, specific one to spot. So fear is when you raise your eyebrows up, you widen your lids so the whites of the eyes show. Um, oftentimes someone will draw back their lips or open their mouth slightly to <gasps> take in a deep breath. Mm. Um because they're trying to get their oxygen in case they have to fight or flee. Um, and what's really important about this is you never know what trigger is going to set off someone's panic. And once yeah. someone's in fear mode, it's very, very difficult for them to listen to any logic. So I'll give you a very specific example um, for dentists. If you're interacting with someone and um, you're just talking to them about um, some the, the things that you're going to do in your appointment, and maybe you say, you know, first I'm going to do some x-rays, and all of a sudden they flash a microexpression, a fear microexpression at you. They widen the whites of their eyes. They tighten their lips and pull them back very, very slightly. And we cannot help these microexpressions. They're involuntary. If you were to see that around x-rays, 
the best thing that you could possibly do is pause right there mm. and say, oh, you just want to be clear. X-rays, they're totally painless. They don't hurt at all. It's a really quick, easy, you don't even have to get out of this chair. We can do them right in the chair. That, why that's so important, as I call that um, dynamic communication, is you probably have a spiel you do every time you see a patient. Right. You have a spiel every time you talk to your Your assistants your are sick of it because they've heard it over and over and over. It, exactly. The worst thing a dentist can do is they go through their spiel without noticing any of those fear micro expressions. Because what happens is you said that was your first line. So first we're going to take some x-rays. That person's amygdala immediately begins to fire. They immediately go into fear mode and they show you that with a very fl quick flash of that fear microexpression. You keep going through your spiel, but they're no longer listening because mm -hmm. once your amygdala is engaged, it's incredibly hard to be able to process any verbal information. So you're going through your spiel and they're barely listening because they're still stuck on the x-rays, right? They're still right. worried about that. So what ends up happening is you get to the x-rays, they're already anxious, they're already tense, they're already nervous, that requires even more explanation, and then you have to repeat yourself, or the hygienist has to repeat themselves after you've already done it. Yeah. That's also how you're gonna get people who are going to push the bill more, who are going to not wanna come back, who are going to not want to, who are gonna not do their, their twice or three times a year cleaning, they're gonna only wanna do it much less frequently and come in when things are already bad. That's how you get less referrals. When you are dynamic and responsive to those very, very small moments of fear, they don't snowball into larger ones. So I'll share my little micro expression uh, lesson that I learned from you. And this is perfect. This is like this skill. If people can develop this, they're going to be a better communicator at work. They're going to be better with patients, better with their team, with their staff, with their home, their family. Um, you talked about a smirk, like a half smile. Mm -hmm. is, is the micro expression for contempt. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I was like, I do half smiles all the time. Like that's my default smile. <laughs> and I was like, oh crap. I know, I know, I know. And you're not alone. So it's funny, we do, we have a huge body language quiz on our website and anyone's welcome to take it. It's a free quiz. It's meant to, uh, one, you can test yourself. You can see how you do on the body language basics. And two is um, it helps us with our database. We're collecting data. So it's signspeople.com slash quiz. And one of the questions we ask is, what is this face? And we show a picture of a micro expression of contempt. That is the one that most often people get wrong. And they often mistake it for boredom. Mm. That's a very dangerous mistake because contempt and boredom are very different emotions, right? Contempt is superiority, it's sustain, it's disrespect, whereas boredom is apathy, it's passive. And so most people think of a smirk as no big deal, kind of a, a, a passive emotion, with which actually that one-sided smirk means I'm better than you, um, I don't like you, I disrespect you. And so you have to be extremely aware of that, that one-sided mouth raise. And you can just try it yourself right now. If you lift one side of your mouth, you kind of feel smug, right? You kind of feel like, hmm, I don't know about this. Right? I, don't, do, don't do it for too long. <laughs> well, and, and I realized I was like, I'm smiling like that while I'm listening to people. Like, I don't, I don't want to mm -hmm. display that either I'm bored, which would be even mistaking it for the wrong thing. I don't want to act like I'm bored all the time, but if I'm secretly displaying contempt, I'm better than you, you know, all these things. And then I started thinking like, maybe I'm just a jerk. Maybe, maybe I'm just a bad person. <laughs> no. no. Here's what happens. And I work with a lot of very, very highly competent people. So, um, in our, uh, people school, it's an online course we have, we have a very certain kind of student. And typically these are very high achievers. They're very successful in whatever career choice they've chosen. And typically they are very high in competence. So um, they're very, they have a very um, in-depth skill set. And that could be dentistry, it could be uh, computer engineer, it could be um, a graphic designer. Usually they have a very, very specific skill set. And what happens is if you are very high in competence in your skill set, you become a master in your area, whether that's an entrepreneur or a dentist or an uh, engineer. Sure. And because of that knowledge, in a certain sense, you are more knowledgeable than most other people, especially in your area. And so what can happen accidentally is when you are so knowledgeable and you're listening to someone else speak, you already feel very highly competent. So that can sometimes come out as, I already know this. Now, I already know this is a really challenging thing because one, it's, it's an indication of closed mindedness, right. but also you might already know it. Right. Right? If, someone's, if someone's sharing something with you, like you're listening to a patient and they're explaining a 
classic case of XYZ. You've heard XYZ before. You know all about XYZ. You know exactly what they're going to say. You've seen it a million times before. That can leak out as contempt. It's not that you don't like the patient. It's not that you feel better than them. It's just that you already have heard this before and you just want to get onto the solution. Right. So that's a problem of very highly competent people that they struggle with without realizing it. Well, and so when, when I realized this, I was like, man, I this was right about the same time I was starting my podcast. I needed like a picture of myself for the website, for the cover art. And so mm-hmm. I took my camera with a timer and I had it all set up in a, in a room with like gray paper behind me and some lighting, things like that. But because of your work around micro expressions, I listened to some podcasts that I, I love, like the Fizzle Show, for example, that you've been on. Mm, yes. And, and like Chase would make me laugh and I would take the picture while I was like laughing and smiling because I wanted like the true full micro expression of just like joy and happiness. One of the things that I actually forgot about design ergonomics that I was reminded of recently was that there's a history between Dr. Scott Luna and Breakaway Seminars and Dr. David Ahern and design ergonomics. So if you go back to the threads on Dentaltown, originally where Dr. Luna laid out his first practice that he designed from scratch and did that startup. He used design ergonomics to design his office nearly a decade ago, and he continues to reference them in his seminars today. And you guys know I love overlapping, reinforcing opinions, and these two companies, Design Ergonomics and Breakaway Seminars, are united on so many things, and they are all about rethinking dental office design, maximizing the return on your investment, and the ability to get into your own practice sooner rather than later, and doing so via efficient design. They share central stocking, rear delivery, the layout of operatories, and the amount of space that you can get into a given square footage. They're they're on board. The other thing you guys know I, I love is contrasting opinions. So if two people agree on 95% of the things, I love to know what they disagree on and why, and that's okay. For example, when it comes to delivery, so where the hand pieces are, Breakaway preaches rear delivery off a do-it-yourself headwall and some low-cost equipment solutions. And while this is extremely economical, this method can have an impact on your career longevity because of the ergonomics. In contrast, design ergonomics recommends over-the-head delivery that allows for a more ergonomic efficiency, which provides the dual benefit of improved health and significantly higher productivity. While the Ergo solution is marginally more expensive at launch, they have seen offices both increase production and have enhanced profitability that easily allows them to recoup the costs down the road. To learn more about different delivery system layouts and how they can impact your practice, go to desergo.com, D-E-S-E-R-G-O.com slash delivery dash systems. And on that site, they've got all four delivery systems over the patient, side delivery, rear delivery, and over the head. No matter what you end up going with, Design Ergonomics is going to help you implement it in the most efficient way possible. For maximum discounts and savings, be sure to mention that you're a Shared Practices podcast listener when you go to designergonomics.com. Oh, that's so good. So that's actually a really, really great way to do profile pictures. Um, We've done a lot of research on profile pictures in our lab, and it's very, very clear that what people want is authentic emotions. Yeah. You don't have to be hugely smiling in every picture. You just don't want to be doing an emotion that you don't actually feel. So if you are feeling serious, great, take a a serious pose, but don't feign seriousness because you think it looks more powerful. (laughs) So as long as you're authentically feeling it like laughing because Chase is hilarious and he is, then, then that's a great way to get an authentic smile of happiness. Yeah. And, and it's amazing how easy it is to pick up on these micro expressions that it's like the difference between an authentic smile and a, and a forced smile is like night and day. It's so weird. Yeah. And we, there's te- very easy tests um, that you can do. I think in my book, I have a couple pictures of fake versus real smiles. And when you see them side by side, it's so obvious. However, if I were to go on LinkedIn right now, I guarantee you that 80% of the smiles that I would see are fake. No, totally. Which is just so, it's just so funny. Like I, 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 I always wonder to myself, you know, there had to have been a more authentic picture of this person, but for some reason they thought that the more demure smile, the more calm smile was better. 
No, and I, I found uh, the other day, I found a perfect example of the smirk smile on, uh, mm-hmm. there's this physical therapist who makes fantastic videos online. His name is Brent Brookbush. If you guys want to see a perfect one-sided smile, <laughs> Google him on his pictures and n- number one and number two have that like smirk. And you just feel a little bit like, I know everything and you know nothing. Like when, when you look at him, which is when it comes to PT, like as a physical therapist, it's absolutely true. He knows a ton. But yep. to communicate that as like the default, here's me and who I am, um, is not what we might always want, especially on our profile pictures or our websites and communicating our, pictures of our team and, and our, our dental page, all of that. You know, you, you want to take that into account. Yeah. And also don't remember that it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just probably an ev- evidence of your mastery. You spent a lot of time in school. You spent a lot of time practicing. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just want to make sure that it comes across and it serves you. Well, this has been really good with micro expressions. I want to dive into hands. So in your yeah. TED talk, you talk about how hiding our hands can be a problem. And, and I immediately thought of what we do in dentistry, which is a lot of times we'll walk in, we'll be kind of to the side or behind the patient. We've got a chart. Maybe we've got a mask. We're kind of talking to them while we're, while we're looking Mm -hmm. at x-rays, while we're doing other Mm -hmm. things and we lean them back. And then we like literally hide our hands because we're hiding weapons. We're hiding Mm -hmm. syringes or tools that could hurt people and, and make people nervous. So you talk about hands and hiding hands. Why is that such a, a bad thing to do? We are surprisingly attuned to people's hands. And the reason for this is because our hands, in a sense, are our deadliest weapons. They also show intention. So, you know, obviously, if we're going to get harmed by someone, we might get shoved or punched in the face. So we're attuned to hands from that perspective. But in a non-threatening perspective, like if you're going to someone um, to meet someone at a networking event or you're in their office, obviously, you know, they're not going to shove you. But you are looking at their hands for intention. Is someone going to reach out and shake your hand? Are they going to give you a high five? Are they going to give you a fist bump? Are they going to hand you something? And so a lot of our brain is very aware of what the hands are doing, what their intention is. And most of all, we love, love, love getting any kind of physical touch because it produces oxytocin. And oxytocin, you know, is a very interesting chemical, but one of the things that it does is it builds trust. And so the moment someone shakes hands with us, we get this burst of this chemical that makes us feel belonging, which mm. is so powerful. And so we're also kind of looking at hands like, am I going to get an oxytocin rush? You know, just like, you know, there's a big piece of cake, you know, sitting on the counter. You kind of wonder, am I going to get a piece of that cake? Right. Am I going to get a bite of that cake? It's kind of the same thing with hands. We're wondering, am I going to get some of that? Like, that's kind of what we're wondering. Um, and so one of the most important things you can do in, in dentistry specifically is, one, you sometimes do have a weapon, right? Right. You do have there's, a There's a reason or, to hide your hand because what's in your hand is worse than the hidden hand sometimes. Exactly. And so in that case, yes, you do absolutely (laughs) want to hide your hand because that can lower the amygdala response. However, especially if you are in the first 20 seconds to a minute of an interaction, that is the single most important time to have your hands visible. And by the way, this can be under gloves. It's it's totally fine. The biggest question I get from this is, it's okay if I wear gloves? Cool. Good to know. No, that's great. It's just about intention, right? So it's about seeing the shape of the hand. So when you first walk into some into someone's um, either in the, in the waiting room to greet them or you're walking into where they are in the chair, you want to lead hands first. And you want to be very clear about this. So making sure that you're giving that handshake right away, that you're not just touching a shoulder. So one thing that happens a lot, which I noticed when I was observing dentists, is that sometimes they'll come in and they'll um, walk behind the patient's shoulder, but right? you come in from behind right. and they're kind of looming over the patient. What happens is that sets the patient up already for, uh, Ooh, I feel a little uncomfortable. Someone's looming over you. They're coming in from behind you. Um, you're kind of leading more shoulder first as opposed to hand first. Right. And they maybe, maybe get a shoulder touch, but not always a handshake. Your best thing is to come in immediately, um, get down to their level. So usually there's a stool or a chair, you actually, in your first impression, want to come straight in. If they're sitting, you want to sit too. Um, that's because you don't want to loom over the possible that seat in the chair and then put your hand out immediately first. This way it kind of puts you on equal footing um, right away and it's very clear what you're doing. You're coming and you're getting on their level and you're immediately open with a handshake. As opposed to, and this is, this happened to me in the dentist chair, 
having a dentist come in and I wasn't sure if he was going to shake my hand or not because he had gloves on and I wasn't sure, am I supposed to shake them? Right. Yeah, gloves on. Right. And so what ended up happening is we did this really weird, um, like half hand handshake. <laughs> like I put my, you know, imagine bending at the elbow and kind of shaking at the shoulder, uh-huh. you know, cause he kind of like put his hand in my hand and we started to shake. It was so awkward. It was right. so awkward. So just be very intentional. Your patient is watching you very carefully to take all kinds of cues from you. So you know, are you competent? Are you warm? And that would be one way to really be clear about it. With with this, I would ask, um, so I tend to walk almost down to kind of the foot of where the patient is and like turn and, and do the handshake standing up. Should I sit in handshake or should I stand? In, like it's operatories are kind of the worst way to be introduced to someone ever because like you said, yeah. from behind, from the side, gloves on, gloves <laughs> off. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why we have so many dental patients because it's dental students. Cause it's so, it's such an odd thing. So what I would say is if it is easy for you to sit down, yes, please do. If you have to go futz around for, to get your stool and roll it over, do not do it. Okay. So a lot of our students will set up their offices so that there is a stool right when they walk in. And so they literally can come and sit down and shake hands. They'll actually kind of reorganize where things go. Or they'll ask their hygienists to put the stool kind of forward for them if they're coming in to kind of get the room ready for them. So the, if possible. the timing of the handshake is more important. So handshake yes. within like the first five seconds of interaction is the best way. Yes. And that has actually been proven through research that we want to see the hand almost immediately. And we also want the touch immediately. Imagine a first impression where you're bent, hunched over, search, fishing for a stool and rolling it out. Mm-hmm. Not a great first impression. So I would rather you just get that that quickly. And if, if it's not there, no problem. Um, as long as you're trying to get it so that you're having a really clear, I'm coming in and I'm shaking your hand to greet you. Well, um, is there anything else that's essential in that first interaction? Because this is kind of all, all the time we have with you today and we're gonna have to wrap things up. But what else would you say? Yeah, so the other thing that you want to think about here, and I try to teach this with dentists, is um, proxemics is the study of space between people. And um, one thing that's really important is that Oddly, um, a dentist often comes in and immediately goes into someone's personal space, right? Like right. you immediately you cross public zone. There's four zones in proxemics, public zone, social zone, personal zone, and intimate zone. A dentist will often cross from a public zone into an intimate zone extremely quickly, hmm. even though the patient knows that's coming, even though logically knows it's coming, it's still very jarring. So what I try to teach um, all my dentists is the idea of the warm up. So a little bit of proxemics foreplay here. So this is a very slow inch into their zone. So you come in and you immediately shake hands. Great. That immediately crosses you from public zone into social zone, right? As soon okay. as you shake someone's hand, that's, that's an easy barrier. Then you kind of, you, you go back, you sit, you're sitting in your stool, hopefully, or if you're standing, that's okay too. And then you have kind of short little greet, meet and greet. Um, then what I would do is if you're looking at x-rays or you're looking at a file, I would actually lean in with this. So I would say, you know, I'm looking at your x-rays, sidle up next to the patient, show them what you're looking at, okay. right? Like you can show them, uh, take a look at this, take a look at our chart. Here's what I see. This looks great. That's another way that you're sliding into their personal zone. Mm. So that's a social zone to personal zone and you're just warming them up. And then before you actually do any kind of exam or obviously looking at their mouth, I always recommend asking for permission. We've actually had a really nice result. A lot of our dental students have told us this has really been a game changer in their practice that um, saying, so can I take a look? Would that be okay with you? Rather than assuming and just like moving your hands towards someone's face. Yes, yes, exactly. Or saying, all right, I'm going to take a look now. Okay. There is such a big difference between a statement and a question, and it's um, I I it's that kind of permission communication is incredibly valuable, and it will make your patients feel like they're whew, able to trust you much more. So just phrasing it as a question, you know, can I take a look? Are you ready to take a look? You know, are you ready for us to start? Any kind of question like that is going to really help because then they're they're ready for you to come into their intimate zone, and you get that yes, which is it's. Also, part of the yes ladder, which we don't have to get into now, but it's also great for bonding as well. Well, this has been amazing. I, I didn't expect you to have so many like dental specific anecdotes and experiences. 
Um, this was just a small taste of, of all the amazingness that Vanessa has to offer. So please go to scienceofpeople.com. We'll have the website and link. Um, you've got several, I think, is there two courses on your website or three? How, how do your, are your courses set up? Yeah. So our, our big flagship course is actually one, it's called people school and it's okay. a 12 week virtual program. So that's right up there too. Cool. Well then people can, can access that. We'll have a link to the, to the Ted talk. We'll have a link to the book. Thank you so much for coming on our show. I learned a lot, even though it was 20 minutes I'm, in my mind, I'm like, okay, now I have a specific checklist of how not to be awkward and how to that uh, proximic foreplay and, uh, you know, working, working your way up to actually being in such a vulnerable space with the patient. Oh, I'm so, it's my pleasure. I'm honored to be here and thanks everyone for listening. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I have a favor to ask of you. If you're listening to this now in 2019, if you're listening to it five years from now and this interview impacted you or you're at all interested in hearing more and you go take some sort of action, whether you just watch her YouTube video, the TED Talk, we'll have a link to that in the show notes, or if you go out and buy her book or are interested in her course, if you then share that, you buy the book, then post it to social media and share something that you you loved about it. Tag Vanessa Van Edwards is her Facebook and Instagram handles are both V Van Edwards. We'll have that in the show notes. V Van Edwards, all one word, lowercase, and shared practices. And, and that means so much to us. It's one of my favorite things to run into someone who's been on our show and it's like a year later or two years later, and they're like, you know what? I'm still getting people who are reaching out to me because of your podcast. Like that just like makes me so happy that the things that we've enjoyed and that have made an impact to us do the same thing for you and for you guys to turn around and say thank you means a lot. It also goes a long way if we wanted to have her back on the show. If people have been like over the next year reaching out and saying, hey, I just bought your book because of shared practices, it makes it a really easy ask for, for us to, to bring her back. So um, as well, anyone who's planning a dental meeting, if you have any input on meetings and want to book her as a keynote speaker for your meeting, I'm going to, I've reached out to them today and, and hopefully I'll hear back in time for the show notes of the best way to uh, talk with them about booking her for a meeting. So I'm going to recommend, I'm going to send this to Mark Costas. I'm going to send this uh, to Reagan over at Productive Dentist Academy and just be like, hey, you know, if you're, uh, if you book her for a meeting, I will show up at that meeting. So just let me know. But um, hopefully you enjoyed this. We will talk with you guys next week. Upcoming exciting news for me, for shared practices. We're going to have a new host on the show next week. And um, we'll go from there. So we will talk with you guys next week on the Shared Practices Podcast.